I used to be very much like this, like, hey, I need a plan. I want to know exactly what I'll map out in X, Y, Z. And then I had this amazing mentor and he used to tell me, Christian, people like you always think there's one way to roam. And then you realize you don't even want to be in Rome. How do you get started on thinking about the science of luck? As far as I was aware, luck was some random chance, blessed to some and not to others, and the end of a rainbow and a pot of gold and stuff like that. Where does the science of luck come into it? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, we always assume that luck is something that just happens to us, right? So, you know, being born into a nice family, stuff like that, that we can't really influence. Um, what I found fascinating, both in my work as entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, but also in my research, is that somehow the most successful, inspiring people they seem to have in common, that they somehow intuitively cultivate a little bit more luck than others. And so I got fascinated by that question. Is there some kind of smart luck here? Is there some kind of process we can influence? So take the example, right? Imagine you have erratic hand movements like I do, and you uh, then you spill a lot of coffee. And so imagine you spill coffee in a coffee shop over someone, and they look at you slightly annoyedly, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. And now you have two options, right? Option number one is you just say, I'm so sorry. Here's a napkin. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person? Option number two, you speak with a person. That person turns out to become the love of your life or your co-founder or you name it. The point is our reaction to the unexpected. Us making the accident meaningful in a way creates that kind of smart luck, that kind of serendipity. And so in a way, a lot of our research focuses on the question, is there a pattern behind all these different stories of serendipity? Is that always the same process of some kind of unexpected trigger happening, but then us connecting the dots and doing something with it? And so that's the fascinating thing. We can create more of those triggers, but also we can uh, learn how to connect those dots better. So is the difference between luck and serendipity, whether it's random or whether it's purposeful or intentional? Well, it's interesting because in a way, both kind of the blind luck and the smart luck, which would serendipity is somehow have some kind of randomness in it, right? Bumping into that person at a conference or, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the example of the of the potato washing machine to to, 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 to give you that, uh, that that point. But the, the, the idea is that, that there's always some kind of element of randomness, but then we have some kind of agency in it. We have some kind of control over not the situation itself, but our response to it. And so take the potato washing machine, right? Essentially... A couple of years ago, um, a, a company in China, they produce refrigerators, washing machines, and, and so on, and they receive calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes, and it doesn't seem to work. So what would we usually do? We'll probably tell them, well, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. Like, it's made for clothes. You know, well, why would you do that? They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected. That's random. But... There's probably a lot of farmers in China who have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? That's how serendipity saw the, the potato washing machine emerged. That's how up to 50% of innovations and inventions emerge. That's how a lot of times we fall in love. It's not only bumping into that person. We have to go on a date. We have to do something with it to actually turn it into that kind of positive outcome that doesn't just happen to us. It seems to me that there's two things that we're playing with here, one of them being how frequently we can put ourselves into situations where the randomness can come to us, and then also our response to those situations, which is kind of how we profit or benefit or make good of whatever happens. Is that right? Absolutely. It's exactly, it's, it's kind of like, in a way, making the accident meaningful. And, you know, that's the exciting having thing. Having more accidents. Having more accidents, right? Like, we, we can literally create more positive accidents. Yeah, that's interesting. It, well, I mean, is serendipity still serendipity if you take an active role in it? Well, you know, that's the fascinating thing, right? When people connect the dots at hindsight, when they look at their CV or so, they would say, oh, this was just lucky there and this lucky here. But then they think about it and they're like, oh, but actually, you know what? I worked really hard to have that luck. I worked really hard to then follow up with that conference guy I, I bumped into and then do this and do this. And so the point here is that actually when you look at serendipity, um, and, and, and the role of people in it, it's more than we, we think, but we airbrush it out of our stories, right? I, I work a lot with, with um, executives. And when you're the CEO of a company, you come into the boardroom and you want to be able to say, I planned this, I did this, and then this happened, right? Yeah, everyone knows that, you know what, like, it's probably more like a squiggle, like, like our CV, right? It's not just, I planned this, I did this, I did this. No, like you bumped into someone and you did this, this, this. But, and that's what I'm so fascinated about this topic, it's instead of thinking, oh, this is weak. Oh, my God, like I wasn't in control. This is actually the ultimate form of 
trying to figure out how to gain some kind of control over your environment and let go of an illusion of control to say, hey, I created a mindset and a culture that allows actually for those unexpected things to happen instead of actually overlooking them, right? You would never see the potato washing machine if you would say, no, this doesn't fit my marketing plan. It shouldn't be here. Yeah, it doesn't happen. And you will be in control of your old plan, but maybe you'll be out of business in a few years when there's so many farmers who actually wanted that machine and your competitor did it, right? And so it's really these kind of things where it's our control over over those kind of things. Well, you can't stop the randomness. That's going to continue to happen. So I think you're right, getting ready to control that. It feels like the the sort of old school business world where everybody would have to wear a suit and a tie and everybody would have to work from the office and everyone would have to be very prim and proper. I think that that illusion of control is kind of masking over the fact that it's idiots all the way up. I've got a <laughs> bunch of friends that I've met uh, and I've spent a, a bit of time with people that are around literally the highest echelons of tech and of business and of finance. And they've said to me, dude, th- no one has an idea what they're doing. Everyone is clueless the entire way up, all the way up, and everyone's winging it. So getting ourselves to this stage now where you go, okay, look, the veil has been lifted. There is no magic that's sort of going on here. What we're trying to do is create a culture or an environment in which this randomness can be profited on. Didn't you have a story about, was it Viagra as well? Absolutely. And, and you know, to exactly your point, right, that's the fascinating thing that, once you let go of this idea that you can control everything, then actually you start building that muscle for the unexpected and that decreases anxiety. You know, I come from Germany. We love to control things, to plan things, to 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 have a plan, right? And then real life happens. You're like, oh my God, like now I'm overwhelmed versus if you're saying, you know what? You know, I, I'll have a plan now, but I'm already building in the, the, the expectation that there will be something unexpected and that's not a threat. That could actually be something even more beautiful, right? And, and we can talk about other, other examples there. For example, Viagra, right? Viagra is exactly this, where researchers were giving people medication against angina pectoris, the, 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 the illness, and, and they realized unexpectedly there was some kind of movement in male participants' trousers. And you know what would we usually do? We'll probably either try to ignore it or kind of find a better way to kind of, you know, get rid of that side effect of, of having that kind of movement. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, that's unexpected, but there's probably a lot of men in the world who might have a problem in that department. So why don't we develop a medication around this? And that's really the thing here, right, to exactly your point that if we're trying to stick with our original plan, just focus on this, we don't see all these beautiful other things that might come of it. And that's the same, you know, in any any part in life and and. Um, that's what what the excitement is. I think that that there's so many mo- meaningful potentialities out there, but but we have to o- open our eyes to it. How malleable or ingrained do you think are people's uh, mindsets around luck? You know, it's interesting because I always thought you know people like what I presume you from from what I've seen myself and, and others who intuitively cultivate a lot of serendipity. There, you know, I first thought, hey, this content is for for those people who then have vocabulary, a language for what they intuitively do. It legitimizes what they do. And then kind of they can go to their boss and say, no, I wasn't out of control here. I actually created um, something that allowed me to to get here. Um, And that works. But but then what's actually much more fascinating to me is the second group of people, uh, like a colleague of mine in London, uh, you know, this kind of eminent professor type person, wonderful person. But he came to me at the beginning when I started this work and he said, Christian, I love you. I love your work, but I don't need serendipity. Like I have I have a nice family. I have a nice job. I have everything I need. Like, why would I need this? So we made a deal. We said, you know what? Why do you not use a couple of, of, of strategies? Um, we can talk about, for example, the hook strategy, which I, which I asked him to, to use. And then, um, you know, ask a couple of different questions, a couple of those things. And then we'll, we'll reconvene in a couple of weeks. He comes back a couple of weeks after and he's like, Christian, I didn't know life can be so joyful. And, and to me, that's really the kind of thing that those people who believe that there's this difference between luck and kind of hard work, those are the ones who once they realize, oh, my God, I can create my own luck, who get the most excited because for them it's the biggest shift versus for others. It's like, yeah, great. I have another exercise here, but it's kind of a more incremental shift. And to give an example, one of my favorites to, to get people into that is the hook strategy. And the hook strategy is all about saying, how can I use every conversation, every interaction to cast a couple of hooks, to put a couple of interesting themes into the conversation where the other person can connect the dots for us? So there's this amazing entrepreneur in London, Ollie Barrett. And if you would ask Oli this kind of dreaded, what do you do question, he wouldn't just say, I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently started reading into the philosophy of science, 
but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should give a guest lecture. Oh my God, such a coincidence. We're hosting piano sessions. You should stop by. The point is I, I'm a big fan of doing a serendipity journal where you write down two or three key themes of, you know, that's what I'm curious about at the moment, how to take this idea into curricula or organizations, yada, yada, and then kind of, you know, plug that into conversations. And it's beautiful how often people would be like, oh my God, such a coincidence, my brother of the sister of the father uh, is X, Y, Z, right? And so, but we can't know this potentiality if we don't put it out there for people to find it themselves. It is interesting to think about how people respond to different situations. How would you characterize the difference between a person who has a life which is more lucky and the way that someone who is less lucky behaves? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and I, I, you know, if I may, I'll, I'll start that, that, that answer with, with one of my favorite experiments, which is a bit of a fun experiment, but I think it, it brings uh, home that point that a lot of it is how we frame the world and how we look at the world and, and how alert you are to what's out there. And so in this experiment, they, um, you know, took people who self-identify as very lucky uh, and, and everyone who's listening to this, like, I'd, I'd love you to think about, you know, do you consider yourself to be a lucky or an unlucky person? And just kind of like then stick with that while, while we talk through that experiment. Um, and so, so they pick people who consider themselves to be very lucky. So people who say good things tend to happen to me and, and yada, yada. And then people who, who consider themselves to be very unlucky. So people who say bad things tend to happen to me. I'm always in accidents and, and so on. And we probably all know people on this kind of continuum uh, and, uh, who, who are on that. Now, they pick one of each and they say, walk down the street, go into a coffee shop, grab a coffee, sit down, and then we'll have our conversation. What they don't tell them is that there's hidden cameras alongside the street and inside the coffee shop. There's a five pound note, so money, in front of the coffee shop door. And inside the coffee shop, there's one empty chair next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big dreams happen. Now, the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five pound note, picks it up, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, sits next to the business man. They have a conversation, exchange business cards, potentially an opportunity coming out of it. We don't know that part. The unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five pound note so doesn't see it, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman ignores the businessman, that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, how was your day today? And so the lucky person says, well, it was amazing. I found money in the street, made a new friend, and, you know, potentially an opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And there's a lot of these kind of experiments where you can put people into exactly the same situation. And by the way they look at situations, by the way they ask questions, by the way they are alert to opportunity, they will completely differently experience that and come out lucky or unlucky. I find a lot of money in the street, unfortunately, mostly pennies. So it doesn't really help my, my lifestyle that much. But I, I like everyone, I would really highly recommend start looking for the pennies in the street and you will continue, continuously find them. People drop a lot of money. I was surprised about that, by the way. So is the big difference there one person's more vigilant, more observant, more open to new interactions? The other person is more focused, less open, less keen about trying to start new connections. Exactly. So that's definitely one one of the factors. I mean, if you look at it as kind of like a couple of Venn diagrams that come together to then kind of shape that that serendipity mindset, one one piece of this is really this alertness and, and this kind of also often curiosity, right, to learn about the world, learn about the environment is the kind of thing when, you know, let's say you take another um, way to work in the morning and, and really open your eyes to the street and see, oh, there's a bookstore. Oh, that book in the store. People haven't talked about this for a while. That should be a podcast. Those kind of things where serendipity then comes from the most unexpected of sources, books, movies, everywhere, right? Everywhere there's potential dots that we could connect. So, so that's definitely a, a big piece. I think another piece in that experiment was also around this idea of, you know, it can help to actually, you know, engage people like, like obviously networks, social capital is a huge kind of factor for um, having that potentiality. But, you know, for closet introverts like myself, um, there's a lot of hope that a lot of times serendipity comes from quiet sources um, like reading a book or that we can actually work with extroverts that they kind of do a lot of this for us. So, for example, going to an event and speaking about an idea with the host first so that the host then talks about the idea, things like this, where we can leverage extroverts if we, if we feel more, more introverted. What would you say is the opposite of a serendipity mindset? I think it's really someone who believes that life is given, uh, you know, 
Serendipity mindset is about the idea that life is extremely socially constructed. I mean, you know, there's 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 fixed constraints, and a lot of my work is in very kind of extreme poverty regions, and those are kind of very fixed constraints. And and I think we have to, while we work on mindset, also work on these kind of societal constraints, societal inequalities. So I think that's a big piece that goes hand in hand with the mindset work. But then on the mindset side, I think it's someone who doesn't, you know, who who doesn't question assumptions, who in a way is kind of in this fixed mindset of of hey, look, the world is just the way it is, and and you hear that very quickly in the language people use, right? When people use language along the lines of hey, um, this is how it's supposed to be, and you know, when I look in the stars, like there's this thing that that is being told to me, whatever it is, like that's kind of like more okay, I can't really influence it. Versus serendipity mindset is about I can influence it, I can do something about it. I hesitate to say that i think british people might be some of the worst at creating their own luck and the word that kept on coming up was cynicism mm. so someone who's a cynic who would always presume that this is the way that things have been this is the way that things are always going to be that isn't open to new ideas that isn't questioning assumptions uh, and i don't know whether that's just the sort of working class towns perhaps that i've spent most of my time in but i kind of get the impression that it's not and i'm out here in austin texas at the moment very much you know i was walking out of the sauna a couple of days ago and one dude went hey man um i think i i think i know you from your podcast what are you doing tomorrow night i was like i, I don't know that was t last night uh and he's like oh, i've just moved into a new ranch uh, i'll give you a message on instagram if you want to come up and we'll put a fire on and you can meet some new friends and last night i made five new friends because nice. this guy decided that that's not that that's never once happened to me in the UK, that sort of openness, it would be significantly more cynical. Rolling it back to what you said before, Charlie Hoopert, guy that does Charisma on Command, which is this huge five and a half million subscriber YouTube channel. Um, one of the questions that he gets asked when he's coaching people on Charisma is how to have a better open and how to make yourself feel, feel more interesting and seem more interesting to people. And one of his best things is to do exactly what you said with the hook strategy. So he is trying to put out a number of different points of contact that people could get themselves on. So I live in LA at the moment. I run my own business, but I've traveled the world for a very long time. I actually coach people on charisma. I once met Russell Brand and I can play the piano or some shit like that, right? Mm -hmm. And that all of those different opportunities there, again, it's the opposite of a cynic mindset of just saying, oh, my name's Charlie and I do stuff on the internet. Like who's who's excited or interested by that person? And I think you kind of suggested that, especially with introverts, there's like a, a first mover problem here, right? Who is it that's going to actually begin the momentum within this interaction? And if someone enters the frame and makes it kind of fun and exciting and banterful and you're able to go back and forth, it's easier for you because you bounce off their energy. But it is really just a tiny little flick of an avalanche at the top and then it just cascades from there. So I do think, even though I, I would also agree relatively introverted myself, I do think that it doesn't take much to just program into you a little script that you can run that kind of sets the tone and then that person's energy increases and you bounce off that and their energy increases and you bounce off that. And yeah, you know the people that are like that. You know the people that when you sit down in the sauna or at a coffee shop or at a party or something that you go, yeah, I want to talk to that person more because they made me feel energized. They weren't cynical. So yeah, I think the opposite of a serendipity mindset is cynicism as far as I can see. Well, and that's really interesting, right? To exactly your point. I mean, one thing that I found extremely helpful as someone, you know, who, you know, we live in a world designed for kind of more extrovert people and then kind of like we try to make the best of it, right? And and have spikes of extroversion. Everyone thinks you're an extrovert, but actually then you're hiding in the toilet after the speech. And so it's kind of those <laughs> things where, um, where where those kind of things happen. And and so what I like, there's two things I found extremely helpful in that regard. One is to think about questions beforehand. So, you know, if you would ever run into that conference speaker or that potential love of your life or something else, you have one or two questions that feel authentic to, to yourself and, and that feel, oh, this, I could literally ask everyone. I could literally ask everyone, what do you enjoy doing, right? Instead of what do you do, which puts someone into a box, if I slightly change it into what do you enjoy doing, the other person can 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 veer into whatever area they want. And I think you had a great point there on energy, right? Then then they get into, out of their autopilot in terms of I'm this, I'm this, I'm this to I actually enjoy this and this and this, where then you can pick up on whatever is most, most interesting. I think the second point, you know, is really when you think about what holds us back a lot of times, what are the kind of fears that 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 are there? You know, is it imposter syndrome? There's always this kind of small little imposter in there or fear of rejection, things like this. 
something that I found extremely helpful is to think about what's the worst thing that can happen. Like I always thought the worst thing that can happen is rejection, right? Conference speaker saying, I don't have time for you. Love interest saying, I don't find you interesting, whatever it is. But then I realized that sting of rejection is nothing in comparison to this feeling of, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person, that feeling of regret, that feeling of like thinking the whole day, oh, if I had done this, could could this and this happen? It's very Mark Twain thing in terms of that you would re- regret the things you, you haven't done over the things you, you have. And and so I think it's it's very much this kind of thing of of really reframing it away from, hey, rejection is really the thing that's, that's the worst here to, hey, uh, the worst thing that can happen is to not act on it and then feel feel really bad about it. That is the best takeaway that I had from your work. The fact that the pain of not closing a loop and the pain of a what if is way, way, way worse than the pain of rejection, especially if you can add a tiny bit of humor into it. Because if someone does like reject you in a rude way, you, it's, it's funnier than it is rude. But the, <laughs> the worst sort of rejection isn't the one that's really rude, yet it's the one that you've got in your mind. And yeah, perfect example, the first weekend that I landed here in Austin in November last year, uh, Tim Ferriss, right? god of the podcasting world one of the ogs uh, was in the sauna cold plunge place that i go to and he went in with somebody that i know right so a past podcaster i guess dr dan engel owns that place dan knows me tim ferris walks in i'm like right okay i know dan i don't know tim i'd love to know tim tim's right there we went in came back out and then tim was sat down reading a book and i just thought i won't I won't interrupt him. He'll, he'll, he's reading his book and he's doing whatever. And now, even now, three and a half months on, I could have just gone up and said, hey, man, I just wanted to let you know you did a how to start a podcast podcast four years ago that I listened to. We're now 50 million plays deep. I just wanted to say thank you for the stuff that you've done. What's that, 10 seconds? 10 seconds. And Tim Ferriss is no way that big of a dick that he wouldn't have at least been accepting of it, if not like genuinely happy to feel that. Because I'd, I'd like to feel that, right? Or, or hear that from someone. But I didn't do it. And it still plagues me to this mm. day. That still hangs over me versus mm. had I have just gone up and tapped him on the arm and said, hey, man, thank you for everything that you do and blah, 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 blah. And who knows what would have come out of that. So I don't have, I don't have many regrets, but that, that from the last couple of months is one that sticks with me. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. And, and I think that's exactly, you know, when you think about it in terms of... It, 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 now it's at least also a good story, right? Either way, like everything that if even if it would have been rejection, right, it would have been a good story. And so the point is, like, to like I'm I've actually become a big fan of rejection in the sense of it feels really bad in the moment, but it literally closes other doors, right? So the rejection of, you know, that love interest where you thought, oh my god, this is the love of my life. And then you realize, and actually, she's like a bit of a, you know, um, that might be great. If you would have figured that out in five years, once you're married and have two kids, it's a bit too late, right? And, so, and, and, you know, that's what I found really fascinating in terms of when does something become the inflection point for something? And that actually a lot of times serendipity comes out of crisis. It comes out of, you know, something not working out, some kind of rejection for a job. And then you're like, oh, my God, I could actually open up my own business and or my own cool podcast or whatever it is. Right. There's a, so so maybe, you know, Tim Ferriss would have said, hey, do this for me. And then it would have ended up as like a medium type, whatever thing versus now you have your own big thing. You know what I mean? So it's kind of I feel almost, hey, great. Maybe that was also the best. So it's almost like, you know, um, it could become inflection points either way. But I think um, that a lot of times serendipity actually comes out of crises or it comes out of things that didn't work. And rejection is a big one there, I guess. There's a concept that I bro scienced into existence called anxiety cost. So you understand opportunity cost, right? That by mm-hmm. doing one thing, you can't do another. Anxiety cost to me is the amount of time that you spend thinking about an unclosed loop. Mm-hmm. So that is a cost mm-hmm. that you could have fixed had you have mm-hmm. just done the thing. Mm-hmm. Had I have gone up and spoken to Tim Ferriss, it would have taken me 20 seconds to walk across the, the room, 10 seconds to speak to him, 30 seconds total time investment, as mm-hmm. opposed to probably hours that I've reflected on mm-hmm. that situation mm-hmm. or the same thing that I need to go to the gym today. If you go to the gym in the morning, that means that for the rest of the day, you can bathe in your self-congratulatory adulation and feel all prestigious because you went to the gym earlier as opposed to leaving it <laughs> until 8 p.m. And you spend all of the day thinking to yourself, I got to go to the gym, I got to go to the gym, I got to go to the gym. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think that trying to limit that by just putting yourself into situations is such an easier way to do that and remembering the pain of unfulfilled what ifs is way worse than the pain of rejection for no matter how introverted you are that's a pretty big motivator 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I love the way you frame that. I think that's a very quotable sentence uh, r- right there. What about different types of serendipity? There must be different categories of some kind. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because in a way, when you think about what is serendipity all about, it's a lot of times there's three different types that, that we found in our work. One is that you're saying you're already looking for something. Let's say you're looking for a job at you know, XYZ consultancy, and then you coincidentally run into someone that you didn't expect could even help you with this, and they get you that job. So in a way, you already knew what you wanted, but you find a very kind of unexpected way to to get there. I mean, you know, the, the quintessential uh, example there is Archimedes, who, you know, he, for his, uh, for his king, he tried to figure out, like, is that crown real gold, or did someone kind of, um, you know, um, mess with a king? And so he didn't find the solution to this, and so he went you know, chilled out in the baths, right? The kind of, uh, in a way, the, uh, the the old version of the of the sauna. It seems like good things happen there, right? It's, that's fantastic. And so he went to the he went to the bath and he lowered himself into the water and he realized, oh wow, like the water will be pushed differently depending on the weight of something. And so essentially, if I do that with a crown, I can I can figure out if if that is real gold. And so he he already knew what he would what he wanted to do, but he found an unexpected way to solve that. Uh, that's the first piece. The second piece is really when you kind of like you're not looking for anything, right? And then, boom, thunderbolt happens, and you know you sit in that coffee shop. You weren't looking for love, but you instantly know that is the person, and then you know it kind of like happens in that moment and and develops from there. So it's kind of a, you're not looking for anything, but it happens. And then the third piece is really more the kind of post-it notes type serendipity where you're looking for something. Maybe you're looking for a job in consulting, and then you get that job, and you realize, oh, I actually don't really. Uh, want it, but on the way you realize, you know, one of the people who interviewed you could be an amazing co-founder for your business, and so you start something completely different. So you look for something, but then you find something completely different in the process. Like Post-it notes, right? They look for a stronger glue, but then realized, oh wow, a weaker glue might be might be much cooler than than that. And so the point is, what they all have in common is there's always some kind of unexpected moment, right? Something that that happens, but then again, we have to do something and connect the dots and 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 act on it. One of the problems that I had was with people who say things happen for a reason. So they look back after some catastrophe that they've gone through and they say, well, yeah, but this this happened for a reason. I broke my legs for a reason. I crashed my car for a reason. I lost my job for a reason. The reason that I don't like that wording is that it seems to me to take the agency out of that person's actions, right? That okay, let's say that in one version of the universe, this did happen for a reason and you were meant to get into a car crash and you were meant to break your legs and you were meant to lose your job, right? And then out of the back of that, you've now got a better life. The other version of the story, which I believe, is that something shitty happened to you three times, like car crash, broken legs, lost your job, and you overcame that. You went through all of these different situations and you made something good come out of something bad. Or you made something great come out of something good. You know, I had this great opportunity and then I became whatever it is that I wanted or I found my wife or I did whatever, right? That to me is a much more empowering, inspiring, energizing story to tell yourself than like, what, what's the alter- what, what, does it, what do people mean when they say this happened for a reason? You're like post hoc rationalizing all of the good stuff you did and outsourcing it to what? Like some higher power? Fuck that. Like it's your, you were the person that made this go well. So I don't, it feels very disempowering to me when people say that. And it feels like it's kind of like the serendipity mindset or connect the dots as well that you're kind of reverse engineering your own input into this situation out of it and leaving it completely up to chance. Well, that's the interesting thing, right? That if you think about it, and you know, it reminds me of this this beautiful idea that does the situation define you or do you define the situation, right? So in a way, you know, most inspiring people that I know had some kind of inflection points in their life where the question was, will that situation define them? Will they be the one who was broken up with for the rest of their life? Will be the one? Will they be the one who was bankrupt for the rest of their life, right? So do they do they settle with that idea that something went wrong, or do they say, no, this becomes the inflection point for something? And now I find something better or something that that fits better. And so I think that's the fascinating thing, right? And it always reminds me um, that kind of agency, and and that comes really back to 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 the social constructedness of of things. It reminds me of Viktor Frankl, and and um, you know he wrote this amazing book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I read it when I had uh, actually two near death experiences. I I reread it recently, um, but so I've, I've been reading it, and and 
what I've always found inspiring when he kind of, you know, he was in a concentration camp, which as you can imagine, or in, in several, but like, as you can imagine, that's the toughest situation you can be in. Objectively, there's no hope, no meaning, nothing. It's objectively meaningless from the perspective of the person who's who's in there and, and in general from a societal uh, 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 perspective. And, and so it's kind of the, the toughest situation you can be in. And he said, you know what? I still have agency in this situation. Even in this most of meaningless situations, I will create meaning. And so what he did was he was saying, look, every day I will still speak with another prisoner in this camp to make them feel better. And by doing this, now I have a meaning to wake up tomorrow morning. Now I have a reason to wake up tomorrow morning because I still have to talk with so many people to make them feel better. And then I also still want to write that book once I get out of here. And so what he did was he created this duality of meaning of a day-to-day -day meaning where every day there was a bit of a small meaning and then also this big meaning, hey, this is still something I want to do when, when I'm out of here. And I've always found that inspiring as this idea that, look, if Viktor Frankl can do this in a concentration camp, if social entrepreneurs can do that in sub-Saharan Africa, where a lot of our work is... I think we can do that in, in a lot of other contexts as well. And so I think there's always this huge element, I think, of, hey, what is our agency here and, and what can we do with it? And can we define that situation a little bit? What were you doing in Africa? Well, so I, I started working there around 10 years ago, um, but, you know, first for my PhD, which was all around the question of how do entrepreneurs in that context develop their networks to somehow have an impact and, 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 and to scale and to grow. And um, it's become, you know, for me the context where I've learned the most from in the sense of especially Kenya and, and South Africa, I will never forget, for example, the first time I, I, I went there uh, and now a very good friend of mine, uh, I asked him, so so me as someone coming into your context, what should I never ask you? What's the one thing that, you know, these white kids coming into your context always ask you, but like you should never and uh, ne never do that. And he said, don't ask me what I need as a first question. If you would, if you ask me what I need as a first question, you put me into the role of the victim, of the beneficiary, of someone who kind of needs your benevolence. Whereas if you come in and say, what's here? What can we do together? And then you can still like resource and whatever, but we then kind of meet on the same uh, level. And, and I think that to me was extremely inspiring because I think, you know, when I think about all these development efforts over the last decades, a lot of them have failed because there's always this idea of, oh, people just need better nutrition and better education. No, people also need dignity and hope and the feeling that they can create their own luck and that you create like that you don't give them handouts. And I think that's kind of for me, there was a big shift in thinking to say, no, it's not just about lower needs and fulfilling them first. It's starting with meaning. It's starting with dignity and, and then kind of getting from there. And I think that for me has informed everything else I've, I've been doing. What role, or have you, what's the framework that you've got in that case for reframing things? You know, we've spoken about Viktor Frankl, we've spoken about people in sub-Saharan Africa, but, you know, being in a really shitty situation and just manifesting meaning seems like a pretty big task. So have you got some steps that people can go through? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, you know, I would never, like, I, I, I lived in this context for a little bit as a kind of guess, but I would never... You know, I think both from the inside and from the outside, you know, there's objectively resource constraints and we have to work on them. And I think that's a given. So so that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, though, is that in every context, you find people who have a different mindset than than, than other people in, in, in the same context. And so in this context, for example, there's this amazing organization that used an approach that I find extremely useful in those kind of contexts, which is scaling bricolage. So scaling, the be making the best out of what is at hand. So what they do is it's a organization that has a low cost education methodology. So, you know, it's things like 10 steps to use social media to build a business and stuff like that. And what they do is they go into other low income communities. And instead of asking, what do you need? Because they don't have resources that they could give. Uh, and, and that's obviously not the approach they want to use. They say, what's already here and how can we make the best out of this? There's an old garage. Fantastic. That could be a training center. There's a former drug dealer, fantastic. That person has amazing resourcefulness, probably. They probably have a lot of social capital. And if you turn them into a teacher, they can probably turn the whole community around. And so the point here is that you're looking at the world from the perspective of what can we make with what's here versus what we think we need. And that kind of like you can transfer, right? They've used that model in banks, for example, where the old school approach during the pandemic would be we have to fire people because we don't have the resources now to have them sit in the office or have them sit at home or stuff like that. That's always the easy way out, right? To fire people to quote unquote decrease costs. With this kind of scaling bricolage model, the idea is that you go in and you say, okay, what's already here? 
we have this cashier and we don't need them because we have a machine for that now. Well, but maybe that could be a financial trainer and maybe the office could be the broadcast center for the online financial education course. And so the point here is that once you reframe it away from what do we need, we need more budget, more resources, yada, yada, to what's already here, how do we make the best of it? You can create budgets around this, right, where you ask people, hey, have you already considered how you could use the chairs of your neighboring restaurant for your event rather than needing 10 chairs to buy and stuff like that. And then once you do that, you get so used to this idea, oh, actually, there's always resources around us if we see it or not. And that comes back to the serendipity mindset that there's an abundance of potentiality, but we tend to not see it because we're so focused on particular resources and particular things. What do you think it is about the when you're not looking for it, that's when it arrives mentality to do with luck? You know, that buses, you're waiting and waiting, and then when you finally turn away, that's when the bus arrives type thing. I think, you know, it's co commonly held wisdom. Have you ever seen this arise inside of your own work at all when people start focusing on things less, somehow opportunities arise too? Because that seems to run quite counter to what we're talking about. One of these is deliberateness, intentionality, whereas that is almost, I, I don't know, like turn your back and forget about it, and then it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, look, and, and I think, um, you know, those thunderbolt kind of serendipities happen a lot of times that right? when you're not looking for anything and then that beautiful thing happens where you fall in love and, and X, Y, Z, things like this. And, and I think, you know, to me, that comes a lot back to the point of am I trying too hard for something? If I if I want this one job in this one consultancy and I'm trying really hard, that can be really great. But I might also close my eyes now to all these other potential consultancies or to all these conversations randomly next to me where someone was talking about that they're looking for exactly the person that I am, but I didn't even listen to it. Is that like what that. you think the problem with wanting stuff too hard or trying too hard is then, that you become um, like overly narrow focused? Exactly. And, and I think what it creates is anxiety, right? A lot of anxiety. I mean, I remember I used to be very much like this, like, hey, I need a plan. I want to know exactly what I'll map out in XYZ. And then I had this amazing mentor and he always... He used to tell me, Christian, people like you always think there's one way to Rome, and then you realize you don't even want to be in Rome. And and to me, that kind of like really drove it home where you're like, geez, like you think you know what you want. You think you know what it is. You know nothing. To your point earlier, we're all just winging it. Like, how can I know now what I want in 10 years? Like, how is that even possible? I don't know. You know, I, I know, you know, it, I have a beautiful family and things like this, but, you know, we might kind of like whatever kind of like life kind of happens happens in terms of you know we'll find another city to live in whatever whatever you never know what happens the point is that i think you know from our work and and i the, the inner research in me comes out when when you ask that question the nerdy one uh, uh, who says we just did a study actually with with ceos where we try to figure out what is it that makes the most successful ceos really successful and the one key theme that they all have in common is that they're extremely good at saying here's a sense of direction if I'm running MasterCard, here is my sense of direction. We want to get 500 million people into the financial system who were previously unbanked. This is our North Star. This is our sense of direction. Here's an approximate strategy. But I'm already telling you now that we will adjust that strategy based on your information coming in. So what they do is they, they give people a sense of clarity of where we're going, but at the same time also build the unexpected as part of the plan. And I think that to me, in my own life and, and in the lives of others, I've, I've seen that that decreases anxiety so much because you're saying, yes, I have a key sense of direction, but I'm also open to the unexpected. And even if I don't, I work a lot with young people. And young people, there's so much pressure on them in terms of find your purpose, find your meaning, find this and this. I mean, come on, when you're 18 years old, like how are you supposed to do all that? So I'm a big fan actually of asking them, what's your curiosity, right? What is What is something that really you're curious about and then that becomes your sense of direction for a time. And then something else becomes. And then you more and more go towards the sense that, that, that who you are and who you want to be in this world. But I think as long as we don't know that, I think a key curiosity gives us a sense of direction without overpressuring that plan. I think that's to your point. If we get too rigid with a plan, that's when things go wrong. Well, as soon as you have that plan, especially one that's rigid, you then begin to measure the difference between where you are and where the plan said that you were. And inherent in that is that there's going to be some anxiety around however far away from it you are. And then over time, this is going to diverge. Yeah, I am. Um, I don't know. I think that that sort of flexible approach would implicit in that the subtext of having that flexible approach is that you can be more confident that future you will deal with whatever problems arise. Like the reason that you have an unbelievably strictly laid out plan is 
basically because of a lack of faith that you could come up with a solution impromptu now and now and now and now and now. So by having a more flexible plan, that empowers the people who are following the direction to say, well, look, like, you know, we knew that this was going to be a thing. They're constantly being more vigilant because they know that they're actually on the lookout for new opportunities. And generally, I think I have this friend who uh, spends way too much money on supercars. And he always says that um, when he buys another one, I have faith that future Andrew will pay for it. And the point <laughs> is that he believes in himself so much that it doesn't matter. He's like, I'll spend the money now and the guy tomorrow will end up paying for it. Now, I am aware that some people have probably got themselves into some pretty severe credit card debt by also taking that point of view. But he has evidence as well over time that he's accumulated that shows him that he's probably going to be quite okay. But yeah, I think um, I think taking a looser approach, heading towards some sort of a North Star, rough hewn on the way up there, I think that that's a pretty good way to go about it. Well, and the interesting thing is to your point, right? If if that's kind of being hand in hand with a kind of measured risk taking approach, right? To your point versus like overconfidence, maybe that that some people kind of uh, in in some some ways might might do. Um, you know, that, that's kind of like I think what's fascinating about when you look at at successful people and you study them, what always kind of is with them is that they, you know, to give an example, I was fascinated when COVID happened. And when COVID happened, you know, you had all these old school leaders and the old school leadership mantra is always portray strength, always portray that you know everything, that 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 you have everything under control. So it's a complete illusion of control. And and some people buy it, some people don't. But but in a way, it's completely lying to everyone. Right. And so, you know, when COVID happened, you had these kind of in the US here, um, you had some governors or some kind of people who are running the state essentially saying, here's an exact timeline on when we open up, here's exactly what we'll do, here's exactly when like X, Y, Z will happen. Now, when new information comes in, of course, now they have to either revise the timeline and look weak, or they have to hide the data, which a lot of them did, right? The other, the new school leadership approach um, that's based on that kind of more, the mindset we've been talking about is to say, hey, here's our kind of North Star, here's our sense of direction, which is public health and economic health. Here's an approximate timeline based on these kind of things, the timeline is usually then the same as with the other. That's the funny thing, right? It's the same timeline they will they will both give, but they will say, we already tell you now, as soon as new information comes in, we will revise the timeline and that will be part of our plan. And by doing this now, when new information comes in and they revise the timeline, they look strong versus the other ones looking weak. And to me, that's the big difference. This is really not about at all saying, let's let go of everything and like let's let's kind of just be out there and float. No, this is actually being realistic about what you can control and then controlling everything you can control, but then also letting go of this illusion of control. And I think that's where it gets exciting because then to your point, you don't get anxious about new data because that wasn't part of your plan because you said when new information comes in, we'll adjust. Are you familiar with the control problem in artificial general intelligence? Have you heard about this? I did, but but please, I mean, yeah. Okay, so there's a, a an issue that a misaligned super intelligent AGI that is given some optimization function could end up turning the entire world into paperclips because it didn't realize that we didn't quite mean don't turn everybody into paperclips. And one of the um, solutions that's proposed is kind of similar to what you're saying. It's called machine extrapolated volition, right, MEV. And what it proposes is that instead of trying to create in advance a bunch of rules which cover every single potential misinterpretation of every rule and it somehow manages to quantify in code what we mean by good and happy and human and life and brr, everything else right which we already can't define even just using words instead what it says is that you ask the machine to come up with its own solution for what we would have wanted had we have known as much as it knows right so it's this ever mutating ever progressing ever updating solution it's constantly checking against what we would have asked for had we known what it knows which is way way more than we know and it kind of feels a little bit like the malleable uh easy to move plan that you're saying the sort of new wave of politicians and business leaders are following is kind of similar to that we're not trying to say in advance exactly what we're going to do we're going to have a plan which is going to be updated en route and we know that it's going to be more optimal because it's going to be able to adjust to things that we couldn't see, like maybe a global pandemic. And it's going to make us look stronger 
because in advance we said that this was what we were going to do. Well, this is, I mean, that's, that's a fascinating um, theme, right? Because, um, and by the way, those of you interested in this, there's um, the, 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 the World Economic Forum, they have these knowledge maps, which is essentially AI kind of building interest graphs and knowledge graphs and kind of like trying to, like AI trying to figure out how do we, how do we organize your knowledge differently than, than kind of traditional uh, things did? And I've always found that super interesting in terms of what can AI do and, and, and how, is, how is that being organized? But to your point, something that uh, and, and it's beautifully serendipitous that you, that, that you brought that up. We actually just finished a very nerdy paper, those of you are just uh, delighted to share, um, about exactly what is the role of AI in serendipity? Like how do we, you know, when you think about the relationship between AI and serendipity, how does that interplay? And, and one of the key kind of like conclusions we came to was that ser- like, like, like AI is extremely good at, to your point, once you have a certain idea of, you know, criteria of judgment, like something that you're saying, okay, this is what we think we might want or something like this. Here's a couple of criteria of judgment and then let them run with it. Extremely good, right? At getting all the information and all this stuff. But then serendipity a lot of times depends on meaning making, right? It depends on sense making. It depends on this kind of social context. It depends on, you know, AI can f- try to find me my love of my life, but then I have to still have that gut feel of, yes, this could be it versus not, right? And so that's the fascinating thing where this augmentation between AI and the human actually can then scale serendipitous innovation by saying AI can scale the information, it can scale the potential data point and recommend some stuff. And then human meaning making can kind of like connect a couple of those dots. And then if you take that together, you can actually scale that up. And I think that's where these knowledge graphs become extremely interesting, where you can then potentially get more information quicker, but also connect the dots much quicker as, as well. But I think that's at the very beginning of, um, and, and I'm certainly, I'm, I'm a student of this. I'm still kind of trying to learn how all this is playing out. It's, it's a fascinating theme. Dude, read Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom, or mm-hmm. probably Audible it, because the, the book is a little bit of a heavy meal. But mm-hmm. that, that came out in 2014 or 2016, I think. Maybe 2014. And it was a New York Times bestseller, hardcore AI, existential risk, understanding mm-hmm. the different types of takeoffs. So the way the, I have no idea how it became a New York Times bestseller, but obviously cause it's very well written and really engaging, right? But it shouldn't do given the, the topic mm-hmm. that it's about. Um, but that was, that really informed a lot of my understanding about AI systems, but also mm-hmm. the principles that underpin them. And machine extrapolated volition is such a useful tool just to have even if you're not thinking about designing an AI, which obviously I'm not, but <laughs> it's just a really useful th- way to think about having an adaptive plan that moves forward and allowing cumulative wisdom to feed back into whatever it is that you want. Mm. Wasn't there a thing? Didn't you do something to do with rabbit's ears? Wasn't that in the book? The floppiness of rabbit's ears? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's actually, you know, that's a beautiful example actually of of counterfactuals, right? Which I think is always the fascinating thing. What could have happened had you acted on something, right? The beautiful conversation we had earlier about that kind of thing of like, ah, had I gone through with this and X, Y, Z. And so the floppy rabbits is really about this idea that two researchers at the same time gave kind of rabbits some kind of injection, um, you know, testing something. And then the, the, the rabbit's ears flopped and, and, and both of them were surprised. So both of them had the same random surprising observation, but only one of them acted on it. And, you know, realized, oh, my God, that's about blood flow. That's about kind of like, you know, accelerating uh, blood flow and so on. So he kind of helped turn that into arthritis kind of tackling medication and became like got a lot of prices versus the other one didn't do anything with it. And so it's the fascinating thing, right? What we talked about in the coffee shop that our reaction to that unexpected moment, then that's what makes it. It's yes, it's random. But then, hey, what do we do with it? So we've got the uh, serendipity journal. We've got the hook strategy. What else? What are some other ways that people can apply what we've gone through today to try and get a bit more luck in their lives? Well, look, I, I had two near-death experiences in life. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of actually trying to not have near-death experiences in your life, but to actually have the same logic that a lot of people like me have uh, when you face death, which is you just don't care about a lot of things anymore because you're like, you know what? When you're on your deathbed, you won't care about if you have four or five cars in your garage um, and you won't care about so many things you think you care about now. Um, and I'm a big fan of, um, you know, I would literally Google um, deathbed regrets where there's a nurse that wrote down the kind of top deathbed regrets of people who who she had on 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 her deathbeds. And it's always the same things, right? It's always, 
I wished I had lived a life uh, truer to myself. I wished I had spent more time with the people I love and more meaningful connections with them and stuff like that. And so I think to me, this is really at the absolute core of everything we just talked about. Serendipity is about potentiality. It's about who we could be, who others could be. And one thing that can really help us figure this out is to become clear about who, who, who do I want to be? What are the kind of being at values, being at kind of non-negotiable values that, that I feel I want to stand for. So when I'm on my deathbed, that's what I will be happy about, what I'll be proud of. So I'm a big fan of this kind of pre-mortem where you're essentially saying, okay, how do I think about now what I would regret on my deathbed if I would run in front of a car tomorrow? And and I think to me, this comes to a bigger point, Chris, which is I think we always assume, you know, there's a lot of time to still, you know, do the things that feel really meaningful. So for example, a lot of my students they first go into a job that they don't enjoy that much because it gives them a lot of money and networks. And then later on, they do the things they really care about. And one conversation we have a lot is that, yes, like by any means, like if you have student debt and everything else, you, you got to do something to pay that back. And at the same time, don't assume that you have a lot of time. Like don't assume that, you know, life might not be over very quickly. So try to do as much as you can now that actually gives you something meaningful. So if you join XYZ Bank by any means, find out on day one if there's a board member who's excited about similar issues as you are, and can you then get that bank to tackle those issues or something like this where you leverage them as a platform then towards what you're really excited about and build that meaning into it. And I think that comes back to our earlier point that even in those situations where some people might say, oh, I have to work in this bank now for five years before I can do XYZ, no. Try to figure out within this bank if you can somehow develop leverage. A lot of times it's interns who build the most meaningful stuff by finding a couple of people, a couple of champions, and then um, within the organization, then do something really meaningful. And so I think it's really about, um, you know, going on our deathbed and saying, what would I regret? And then thinking from from there what's meaningful to us and, and trying to find the people who feel meaningful to us. I think to your point, right? What are the kind of communities that feel meaningful to us, uh, the kind of themes and, and so on? There's a guy, Alex Hormozzi, who's coming on the show next month, and he recently sold his business for some insane amount of money, and he put a tweet out the other day that said, stop saying that 50 years old is middle-aged. The average life expectancy of a man in the United States is 75.5 years old. He said, 37 years old is middle-aged. You have way less time than you think. And that's Mm. back to your point, right? Mm -hmm. That you do kind of need to remember that the clock ticks down to death. It doesn't tick up from birth. That's the yeah. way That's the way that your life is going. There is a limited number of books that you get to read for the rest of your life. <laughs> there are a limited number of Netflix shows and meals out with friends and time that you get to spend with your parents and time that you get to spend with your kid and so on and so forth. You need to make sure that you use them right. And a lot of the time, if you if you haven't done that pre-mortem, if you haven't looked at what is the direction that I want to go in? Perfect to what you said earlier on. You think that you want to go to Rome and halfway along the journey, you realize that you, that wasn't even the place that you were supposed to end up at. And yeah, going through life to find out not only that you didn't mean to get there, but that you wanted to be somewhere else as well. That's a, that's a, a, a pretty dangerous situation to be in. So yeah, I, uh, I hope that that has scared some people into into realizing they should probably do a little bit of reassessment well and and to your point right i feel it's fascinating once you then face death i think steve jobs says it beautifully right that like of course emotionally like in those kind of situations when he he got cancer right he he had this beautiful um sentence that that death can be life's greatest motivator right imagine a situation where if you would live forever right I mean, what kind of sense of urgency would you feel? What kind of sense of meaning would you feel when you know, yeah, whatever I do, like I'll still be here in like 50,000 years, so whatever, right? Versus like now that you know, actually I only have a limited amount of time, maybe that also can be meaningful in that sense. And so I have actually, um, you know, I spend a lot of times um, after my first and, and second near the experience with people who have cancer, for example, and other terminal diseases. And what I found fascinating is how many of them have then found a deep purpose. So for example, taking the cancer and say, this will be a campaign now, and I'll run this like I ran a campaign in politics, or X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, and I will inform others about how we can go about this and, and you know set up a foundation around it, you name it. And so the point is that I think it's it's kind of, hopefully it never comes to kind of those things, right? Terminal disease and so, which obviously is the worst thing that, that can happen. And at the same time, I think this question of how do we think about that, yes, life, life can be short, 
But also maybe that's not a bad thing in the sense that it can give us meaning to actually focus now on the things that are truly meaningful. And and then, you know, I don't know if you're watching. I, I just started watching this, this show now. I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but it's all about this kind of upload um, where essentially people then get digitally uploaded and then they download again. And it's just a fascinating kind of whole whole thing. I forgot the name of it. But my point is, who knows what happens afterwards, right? Who knows what, what comes next? So let's make the best of what we can do here. Dr. Christian Bush, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with what you do, where should they go? So the homepage is theserendipitymindset.com. Um, I'm at Chris Serendip on Twitter, and uh, the book is in bookstores around the world. Thanks, mate. I appreciate you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.